Hey folks, Captain Mike here from Salty Cape, and I'm here with a longtime and very good friend, Captain Dave Peros, who is the writer for all of our daily dispatches for fishing reports on Facebook. We're trying a new format today. Eventually, this will turn into a podcast. But for start, you're probably watching this on a YouTube video Im- embedded in our Friday fishing report. And if we're organized enough, we'll see if we can get it on a podcast. But the structure for today in this conversation you're about to watch or listen to is basically going to be Dave and I talking about the week we both experienced, both as first hand anglers and just being around in the field. And then we'll take a look at the weather and see see what some nice some some good thoughts for the weekend might be and you might hear some tips along the way and so everybody welcome to our first you know video and podcast of our fishing reports and i guess i'm going to leave it to dave to kick off how he started his his week and walk through some not step by step of the reports but i'll just walk through the week and extrapolate that going forward but thanks mike it's good to be with you I have to say that being a guide, this was a challenging week. We bought a wind. And so that presented its own problems and issues. But I started out Monday. I did something which I tell people not to do, which, you know, it's kind of a pattern, which was don't chase reports. Well, everybody told me, Monomoy, Monomoy, Monomoy. Well, I went to Monomoy on Monday. I thought that the wind looked okay. And let's just say I didn't catch anything at Monomoy. I got skunked. I think I'm probably the only person this year who's been skunked at Monomoy. The wind, when I pulled in the parking lot to launch my boat, was a lot stronger. And if you believe in karma, I think that may have played a part of it because I was like, man, the wind... And uh, this is what great. And we got kind of a late start. And the people who caught fish that I talked to got a really early start. I mean, we probably didn't hit Monomoy Point until 6.30, 7 o'clock. And by that time, we saw a few people catch fish trolling. But then I got in scramble mode, which... Again, something I tell people don't do, you know, stick it out, watch the tide. And like I said, we didn't catch anything. We hooked up a couple of times. But what I heard was that the fish got finicky after an early morning bite. They got finicky. And we saw that fish would come up for five seconds. If you happen to hit them on the head, you might get a reaction. But they were pushing sand deals. We really didn't see any signs of squid for the most part. I'm not saying there weren't fish there, because there were. I know people who caught them. But they were early. They got the bite. And I drove home from Monomoy with my tail between my legs and said, I'm not going back to Monomoy the rest of the year. (laughs) You're one of those those I quit fishing trips? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I hate fishing. I hate fish. (laughs) Yeah, we we, we all have those. We all have those. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I, you know, I'm sure just knowing you and I, mean, I don't even want to count the amount of years we fished together, but I, I know you probably did this. But in that situation, when they're coming up and staying up for a very short period of time, light leaders, teeny little lures, maybe something like a three eight or five eight ounce hoagie epoxy jig lure and all of it, something like that. But you need to be a sharpshooter caster in that because you said one key thing in there. You need to hit them on the head. And I'm assuming what you meant by that is you have a frisbee sized target and that lure needs to be ground zero in the middle of the frisbee target if it's going to convert. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was if you weren't right on them. And it's interesting. We tried a lot of different options, but we did blow up a couple of fish on the charter grade popper. We got it close to them, one pop, bang, and they blew up on it. But again, you had to put it, you know, right in the zone. So obviously after Monday, I looked at the forecast and I was like, boy, this is, you know, I had folks from Alabama and New York in town and I'm thinking I've got to get them out on the water. And, you know, we found fish. 
we actually saw you out there. I think it was on huh, Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. when we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tuesday. Uh, it, I think Tuesday was a blowout. Yeah, yeah. it was windy, and, and so it was painful about hearing your Monday Monomoy experience. You know, I was out a little bit on Tuesday here at uh, Hoagie HQ in Falmouth and Nantucket. The closer Nantucket sound and Vineyard sound rips were, you know, sometimes they're better than others, but they were consistent here in this part of the world throughout the week. And it <laughs> surprised at how keyed in on the squid they are, considering how slow of a, like a quote unquote squid season we had. So it seems like there's still plenty yeah. of squid for the stripers to get very keyed in on. And, and you know, I was just right before this call, I was talking to Captain Eric Staplefeld. And yeah, he's, you know, Amber, 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 talked to Evan at Eastman's, Amber, Amber, Amber. Mm-hmm. And so the translucent amber, whether it's a dog walker or a popper in my universe, is the, yeah. the the reoccurring phrase that I keep hearing. Now, I know from experience on my boat, because I saw you Wednesday in one of the aforementioned rips, and I had the translucent olive, like it's an olive color of the translucent white. And mm-hmm. that was doing just as well for us as the amber. And then just out of curiosity, I put a solid white dog walker on and they had no interest in an all white but the second we switched back to the amber and the at least on my boat the amber and the translucent olive they're both translucent colors it was two rods bent at all time so it's yeah. interesting they're very keyed in on the squid it feels like yeah i mean i was shocked this week honestly to see the level of squid in the rips and just how how ferocious the feeds were there were times if you looked in the rip and it, the water was just boiling with fish and i thought one of the i thought one of the 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 keys this week and you were the first person to mention it which was that they were off the rip at times there were times several you know 100 200 feet off the rip there were bass just boiling everywhere i mean in the flat water and, yeah, and I, fa- I found those fish to be two things. One, a little larger mm-hmm. the fish in the rip. And I think that's more of a, a competition thing. The bigger fish don't want to compete with the faster, smaller ones. And the other thing I noticed is the hookup ratio, at least on my boat, I'm speaking purely from my perspective, was much higher. It was an instant hookup in front of the rip, well in front of the rip in smooth water versus when you're casting and it's directly behind the boat presentation of the lure. And my anglers are getting a lot of hits, but having a harder time hooking up when it was directly behind us versus perpendicular or slightly bow forward casts yeah. into the, again, in the smooth water. Yeah. I think that, you know, you've mentioned it numerous times and we've talked about it. I think that I've noticed on my boat this week and I've noticed other boats there. First of all, I think with with plug fishing in striped bass, way too much reeling and way too fast. I, I think it's an adrenaline thing. I think it's an excitement thing. And I just find found that this week we got fish. We we cast the the popper out in the smooth water and let it sit, and the fish would blow up on it. It was just sitting there wobbling. It was. You know, the, the, it was it was making a little commotion, but it wasn't. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the bigger fish just came up and just crushed it. And well, if you if you think about it, that like what's going on? You have these squid, which are not the fastest swimmers in the world, huh. right? Mm-hmm. And they're just getting bullied by the current and they swept down tide. And that's what the striper is seeing. Is right. these like squid just very vulnerable in the water, just swimming sideways into the rip, trying to stay out of the danger zone because they know what's on the other edge of that other side of that shoal, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I mean, I don't want <laughs> you, Mike, and I, as Mike said, we've been fishing for years, and and one of the things that we do is we do voices a lot of times, and one of Mike's famous voices, he'd throw out a plug or something, he'd go, "Oh, look at me." Poor little squid getting ripped in there. Wham! And the fish would hit. And that's literally, I mean, what it is. I mean, literally, the plug looks like a squid. 
and it's struggling and it and it's just kind of wobbling and it's inter- trying and, to mind its own business, you know. <laughs> <laughs> minding it, that's it. Yeah. Oh, one little squid minding its own business. <laughs> and then wham, it just gets clobbered. But I, I understand the adrenaline rush, but trying to get people sometimes to calm down, you know, let the current work to your advantage. One of my dogs is probably going to go because my wife is driving home. If you hear dogs barking, but yeah, it just, it's just sometimes less is more. I mean, it, and I understand this for you or I, we've been fishing for so long. But, you know, fly fishermen usually kind of get that. But if spin fishermen would think a little bit like a fly fisherman and swing, swing the plug. I mean, that that hoagie charter grade popper, you know, it floats it. it Even if you're not reeling it, it's the rattles are rattling. The mouth is popping. The body is swinging. And it's an easy target. You know, it's yeah, like especially the, especially if you flag it out, and take that bad hook off. You've got that extra bucktail, um, yeah. flowing in the water, and the yeah, yeah. working for you. Yeah, yeah, it, no question. And and look, you know, we've talked about this all the time about rigging, catch and release style, getting rid of the tail hook, and just going with the one belly hook. You know, your plugs just have one belly, so it's not a problem. Some plugs will have two belly hooks. In that case, I repl- get rid of the one closest to the tail, and you're going to miss fish. And you made a great point before that you know you had people hooking up in the flat water more than in the rip. Well, if you think about it, the plug is being it's bouncing around, okay, and it, it it's a it's a hard target for the fish to get hold of, but it's also hard to keep contact with. You know, so sometimes that's why swinging that flat water, okay, you're going to get better hookups, you know? Yeah, uh, a lure going, getting hit when it's horizontal to the rip, mm-hmm. your hookup ratio is going to go up like exponentially versus yeah. like point with the, the tail, of the hook, the tail of the lure is heading backward. Now, yeah, yeah before we move on out of Vineyard near Tucket Sounds, because rip fishing is pretty unique to that those bodies of water you know mm-hmm. compared you know zooming out on the cape is i just want to talk about like just a brief minute on rip etiquette we, we just to maybe relive the conversation you and i had earlier this week and i just want to talk in a positive constructive way about you know because what was happening on well i was out on wednesday is the the tide was you know pushing toward the east Right. And we had a southwest yep. wind to the wind and the tide, tide were together. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so you would slide from west to east on the rip. Right. All of a sudden you'd run out of rip. Yep. And I noticed boats repositioning one of two ways. One, they were going way up in front of the rip and starting way up tide. Actually, three ways. <laughs> and the second way is the straightest line between two points. And that was the my least favorite of the ways where they would just drive the length of the rip back up to where they wanted to go. Mm-hmm. And then then the third way, which I you and I talked about, I've never really seen this before, was running and gunning birds on a rip, and they were pushing the rip. So I thought we could break down, go in reverse order and you know break down sort of why each one of those ways is either better or less better than others. Yeah. But yeah, I'll, yeah. The, I'll start with the, the running and gunning the birds. Because it was interesting on Wednesday, the birds are very clustered. They're very in specific spots, and they're moving from spot to spot. And I think that was just because there was a finite amount of birds in the area. Right. There was fish, like from left to right, right to left. There was fish evenly distributed throughout the whole rip. So chasing the birds was sort of an unnecessary function, and that just caused more boat traffic and disturbance in the water. And you know, a guy like me. When birds are in one spot or the other, and I know zoomed out that the fish are evenly distributed, even if they're not evenly distributed, they tend to shift. And so if you run to one spot, chances are by the time you get there, they're somewhere else. So it feels a little bit like algae fishing. But And so I feel like you're doing more harm than good by facing the birds with the extra commotion and the disturbance in the water. And, and you might go a little nutty because the birds keep moving. And so 
I'm going to, again, reiterate the systematic approach, knowing that they're evenly distributed and, you know, making long drifts. I'm going to let you handle the point A to point B thing up the seam of the rip, because that, that to me is the most problematic. Yeah. I mean, it just, what, what I found was the people chasing birds a lot of times, you know, the one you mentioned earlier, typically if I'm changing position on a rip, I always go way out off the rip. I mean, pr- probably more than I have to go off the rip. Hey, Remy, <laughs> Remy, Remy, quiet. Yeah. Hello. Are you still here? I'm just setting up a little oh, diagram okay. for the rip. Here. Okay, you're going to whiteboard. Yeah, in, in sorry about my dog. She'll she'll bite in a minute. Remy, stop. Enough. You're a good girl. Enough. Thank you. So <laughs> they they listen to me like the fish listen to me. So the thing what I found was that. You were talking about chasing the birds and point to point. And a lot of times the birds are focused on a particular point is that when you're doing that and, I, and I'm and i changing position, I'm off the rip. I actually have people cut inside of me going right down the rip to try to get to a point. I mean, they had no idea I was outside. I'm looking at the rip to reposition and I'd look and they're flying down the rip to get to another spot and totally unaware that there's another boat even there. And what was the funniest part was they would race down the rip, looking at the birds and in their wake, there were fish breaking everywhere and they would go flying past us and I'd let them go by and I would just swing my boat and we'd hook up. Because so, the- say say with the, so this is the boat chasing the bird, the one I just yeah. circled there, and yeah. you're that I, I'm not I'm not an artist, but the middle right. B, and then there's another boat, the third B. This right. boat, rather than just staying and working on these fish, he's obsessed with those birds. Yeah, he was just going straight right across the rip in front of you, where right. I would right. say textbook would say to go. We'll call it yeah. 100 yards out in front and over, yeah. and yeah. I think a, a hundred. A hundred yards is is a is a good rule of thumb. If, um, yeah, hundred yards, fifty yards, something in a, a lot more than you would actually think that you'd want to. But the what amazes me is that they, they would they were right. We we they were right inside of me. They had no idea, you know, that we were even there, and they would just go flying down, and then we would just slide in behind them, you know. I mean, and. Yeah, I mean, and catch fish because there were fish there. And as you said before, there were fish this week. You know, I fished there this morning again. But Wednesday and Thursday and Tuesday as well, that the the, the, the rips were fishing unbelievably well. I mean, they weren't monster yeah. fish. There, there were some good ones, but the amount of squid. <laughs> but But if everybody... And, and then we'll move on from the rips, talk a little bit about Cape Cod Bay. But if everybody took the approach to swing out either 50 or 100, I like 100 because a lot of times there's fish sort of in that zone in front of the rip in the right, smooth water. Right, exactly. Yeah. If everybody took that approach and created sort of like a rotation system, where as you slide, you know, everyone's drifting in the same direction, you can quadruple the amount of boats that can peacefully fish a spot like middle ground or hedge fence or waski or, you know, suck a mess and fill in the blank. And, right. and so the, you know, and so, you know, just the best practices and a lot of folks don't know because it is logical. The straightest distance between two points is a straight line. If that straight lines up the seam of the rip, I guess it makes sense. And you might, and you'll probably catch something if you do that, but you do too many boats do that too many times. You'll, shorten the bite from what could have been two hours to 30 minutes and well, yeah. yeah i mean i'm sorry i mean you know again there are no absolutes in anything but the bottom line is running up a rip line in the white water at Boots any fish. time is wrong it, you, you 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 it's it's dangerous it's wrong it it's unproductive it's it's discourteous Disru- disruption to other boats yeah yeah and, it, uh, it, it's inexcusable and I see people do it. I get the excitement. And I think it's really important 
as a guide myself to, to explain to folks that I'm not picking on recreational anglers or newcomers because I tell you, some of the worst behavior I've seen on rip lines is from guides. Okay. And also, and also shit, ha- hell, shit happens. Like, for example, I was out on Tuesday and I was at Hedge Fence and I had two anglers in the boat. Two fish came in. It was a bit of a precarious deep hooking situation in the back. All of a sudden I looked up and I drifted down on another boat and I was inappropriately close. And I, and I bill myself as being very proactively, you know, courteous, but that happened. And all it took was a friendly wave. Hey man, sorry. Drifted down, I had two fish, and then I did the whole go up in front of the rip far away. It was yeah. cool. It was like, you know what I mean? And so so if something does happen, it's not the end of the world. A friendly, courteous little, hey, sorry, I got too close. And then the one parting tip here is, you know, if you're coming up and setting up on a spot, if another boat has to stop its cast short to not hook yours, I feel like you're stopping too close to another boat. That's a good rule yeah. of thumb. Yeah, that, like. that's a very that's a very good rule of thumb. The other thing I would say too to that is that the challenge, for example, that you see a lot of people a lot of times trying to fish a rip by themselves. That's a totally different subject. Don't want to get into it. I have my own opinion about it. Bottom line is you're both getting sucked into the rip. And when it's really moving, the, your first responsibility is control of your boat. 100%. Okay? You know, and I stem the tide. Okay, I go by the Hoagie playbook. Okay, a little plug for the Mike, Mike, uh, Captain Mike's intro playbook, and the casting into a rip approach. And I like to stem. I know a lot of guys don't have someone to run the boat for, and they set up and they drift into the rip, and you see them drifting down at you, and they basically have given up complete control of their boat. Personally, I'm sorry. You're responsible for your boat. You drift down on me and I'm stemming the tide and I stem. I hold my boat in its position to give my people their best shot. That's, you know, that's your, I mean, that's your problem. Now, obviously, if you crash into me, then it's my problem. But it's interesting you mentioned because, you know, at a a future date, we can talk about, you know, your experiences at Waski when you were running the Doughboy and Chattering. It's the same thing. You hook up, you have to drift out of the rip to land a fish, and you'll see people jump right in behind you where you were. Common courtesy is when that person swings around and comes back, if they kind of want to get back into that spot, and your thing is so true, there are fish everywhere, okay? And we don't own a spot. However, if I sneak in when someone drifts through and I see them, they want to come back, I go somewhere else. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And everybody has a time in it. And I remember, I feel like rotation systems were far more common when I was running a charter boat in the 90s. And so people would figure out, it was fewer boats too, but but everyone would have their time. If you didn't get a fish in your you know five minute window, you would slide off in the next boat. It was sort of like a, it was almost like there was an unofficial traffic guard waving boats through and everybody even if some of the charter boats had beefs between each other, it was gospel to follow that that harmonious rotation system because every like everyone wins in that scenario and everyone loses if people aren't collectively working as a team in a spot and uh, more boats can fish the same spot. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, and I will say uh, this: looking ahead to the weekend, just be advised, fishing's good, but there are going to be it's going to be a good weekend. Weather-wise, looks nice, the lighter winds. There are going to be a lot of people, and you might think to yourself, get out early, get your fish, and maybe go find your own fish somewhere else. Because I can tell you, at middle ground, by about 7 o'clock, you see people waking up, and the rip just, it's amazing how many boats show up. I mean, And, there, and, there's, and, there, and I want to move on to Cape Cod Bay in a sec, but yeah. there's fish on... Every rip, pretty much, some more than others. And yep. yeah, so I am clueless, Dave, about what's going on in Cape Cod Bay. Have, have you heard anything? I know, I know from a hoagie wearing the hoagie hat perspective, we're shipping a heck of a lot of tubes to shops that cater to that neck of the woods Absolutely. and yep. to the e commerce. So it's been a, it feels a little early to me for the tube, but I guess with this heat wave, it doesn't surprise me. 
but uh, you know, we're blowing our June record this year for tube sales in Cape Cod Bay. Yeah, I mean, it's really you, you're what you just said was the same for me when when I, I talked with Jeff Miller, he's up at Canal Bait and Tackle. And when he was talking about tubes, 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 I sold out all of my tubes today. I sold all my worms out today. And it's the same story in other shops. I'm thinking, tube and worm in June? It just, it didn't. But I think that's kind of a pattern for this whole season. Nothing has, in my opinion, has gone to what, you know, which is, you know, I mean, that's fishing. Right. But the interesting thing is, according to Jeff, a lot of the tube and worm fishing has been in deep water. It hasn't been in that fairly tight, the sandy neck. It's actually been out, you know, 40 feet of water, 50 feet of water. Um, like, And I'm a newbie to Cape Cod Bay being a Thalmouth boy, but that's like fishing ledge out that way or? Yeah, yeah. A fishing ledge, you know, well off the parking lot. And again, that's where, you know, in your case, we've th- talked about it. You have the trolling weights. Okay, you lead core line. Jeff said they're still selling lead core. In fact, he sold all his lead core out. You know, I know a lot of people associate wireline with fishing deep, but lead core is a lot easier, especially if you have inexperienced anglers. It will get down really well, but you have the trolling weights. Yeah. And so, yeah, I have a few tips in that regard. So I used to be, well, you know, we've been fishing since the 90s, but I'm not going to do the math, but I used to be a huge advocate for wire in the early 90s, then a huge advocate for lead core, then the evolution. Then you'd see me with my fancy LC13 custom cut up from Cortland. Now mm-hmm. come to the point where I feel like I can get deeper with 40 or 30 pound test braid mm-hmm. in combination with a trolling weight. And interestingly, in that situation, I like an unweighted tube. Like we have with the, you know, the tubes we make, they're technically weighted because there's a, an an ounce and a quarter stainless steel helix core to make it swim down the middle. So it's not weight free. But do I like, I use a technique, you know, called the, you know, the the troll scan. So I'll troll along with the weights, but with that light braid, if I were to take the boat out of gear and either put it in free spool or just let the weight of three and a half or four, four ounce sinker sinking it down with the tube. It gets down so it I feel like it almost gets down faster than the lead core because there's such less, so much less restriction of that thin braid and that trolling weight. Now remember that that tube is weightless, so it just sinks down. I just lay them on the sandy bottom and put the boat back in gear, and that emergence off the bottom is where at least in my, the, the you know I push Cape Cod Bay with the tubes maybe a half dozen dozen times a year, oh, half dozen times a year. And like, that's where we got all the hookups is when we emerge it off the bottom. It's a very, I think a lot of people think tubes look like sea worms, uh, look like eels. I think the bass are thinking they're giant sea worms and just yeah. slow and lethargic emerging off the bottom is, I, I feel like what the natural look is. Yeah. And I think it goes back to what you said before. People always ask me, you know, can you fish a tube without a worm? My answer is you can. Don't expect to catch anything. Okay. They, that worm makes a huge difference. It makes all the difference. Now I've known. So people- I'm, I'm on the same camp as you, but we sell a lot of tubes, a lot of folks that don't put anything on them and have great luck. I'm yeah. just too stuck and we're yeah. from the same fishing generation. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard, but to, again, it's hard to depart from that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to change the thing. I know guys who have used deal skins for tubes. I've known you people who've used pork rind for tubes on tubes. You know, again, and I personally use the fish bite sea worms. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. And and it feels weird to me because again, I'm I, uh, I'm fairly old school individual like yourself. We get mm-hmm. along famously that way. But uh, yeah, the I, uh, yeah the fish bite sea worms is unbelievable. I uh, they're awesome, you know, Captain Nat. Yeah, Captain Nat yeah. Chocolate turned me onto those. Yeah, those are awesome. And I'm going to tell you right, the whole fish bites thing. If you're taking your kids cup fishing and you're used to doing squid. The fish bites work super well, and they stay on the hook a lot longer. I mean, they just, you know, we're, you know, so, you know, the fish bites definitely work. You know, it's interesting. You were talking about your tubes. Jeff was telling me that the hoagie tube, perfect tube, is bar none the absolute favorite of, of kayak fishing, kayak guys. And, I mean, honestly, 
it's almost like kayaks were born to tube and worm. Oh, it's, it, yeah. The, yeah. Go as slow as you can go and then cut it in half is always the advice I gave for tube and yeah, worm. Yeah, exactly. And my, he, Jeff was saying they absolutely love the, the hoagie perfect tube. You, you know, uh, because they just, you know, like you said, that if there's a mistake that most people make on the tube and worm, it's they go too fast. Okay. They just do. And to get back to what you were saying about, you know, you're an electronics guy. You know me. I have no idea what I'm looking at on my electronics. But I know people, I mean, Bruce Miller told me years ago, he said he, he would be tube and worm. He would mock fish. He would put it out of gear and let and let line and drop the tube right down in the fish's head. And, and Tactical and like, trolling. It's a lot more interactive, too. So as an correct. angler versus a catcher, the angler mm-hmm. in me likes that tactical yeah. approach because it's very yeah. interactive. Now, now what one, are you hearing? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, oh. <laughs> overboard. Yeah, no, we got my uh, AirPod. Okay, you got the AirPod. Don't blame yeah. me for dropping it overboard. I've had to have my mic in the past and handing off his iPhone. We watched it go over the side of the boat. So It's amazing how slow the iPhone sinks. It's <laughs> torturous. But the interesting thing is there are some pogey schools up in the Plymouth area off Man and Met. If you remember two years ago, they had those acres of pogies up there and everybody was up there snagging and dropping. And apparently they're there. But Jeff was telling me yesterday, yeah, if you find a school of pogies, you can fish. But what's been working, he said the best, is trolling deep diving swimmers. Like the hoagie tried a great swimmer. He said that that. That type of plug has been crushing it in 40, again, 40 feet, 50 feet of water. You know, some people just get so obsessed with the pogey schools, they lose their minds and forget that, you know, hey, troll a swimming plug, get a pro tail down, you know, do something different. And Jeff Jeff was real. I mean, it was kind of cool when he sent me the text and he said, by the way, just so you know, trolling is to taking more fish than snag and drop because the pogey schools are not super thick and, and heavy. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, and judging by the, the fish picks I'm getting from captain Terry Nugent, you know, he's getting to real, and he's fine. I never really thought of him as a uh, troller, but he's gotten it down to a very tactical way. I just want to say one footnote is I had, we had some tips about the perfect tubes and the hoagie swimming plugs. These tips are, you know, there's a number of other, you know, perfectly good brands out there too. And these tips are all, you know, obviously I'm biased with the, the hoagie hat that I'm wearing, but, you know, but, but all these tips are, you know, certainly pertinent to, you know, the other brands out there. Obviously, you know, which ones I think look better, but <laughs> opinion there. But, you know, just one thing about fishing around bait and, you know, my my roots. I started off as a fly fisherman, so I'm definitely a lure guy. But but when there's there's plenty of situations where I call you encounter a problem of too much bait, right? And I don't like competing with Mother Nature. So if you have like a big school of pogies, say I don't want to compete with the fish that are eating one pound pogies at will. You know what I mean? Just swimming through the school. I like to search the fish that have gotten off the mark and are trying to get back into the program the adjacent fish mm-hmm. and i and i and i'd go to the grave saying this is why jeff is right in that case with the trolling guys out fishing the pogey guys is the the bass keen on the pogies are like myopically focused on the pogies and trolling the perimeter just near the schools but outside you've got that stripers that are separate separate from the school and you get that fomo the fear of missing out function of those fish and that's how you can more easily, you know, catch those fish and not compete with, you know, Mother Nature measured in actual like gross tonnage pounds. <laughs> you know, well, uh, and, yeah, uh, I mean, and the thing about the swimming plug too is that you don't have to have pogies. You can, if you've got structure, if you know a place where you've caught fish before, there may not be any pogies around. But don't forget, pogies, that's imprinted. And, you know, I mean, let's, let, I mean, we can, we can say whatever we want. You know, I love artificial lures. You love artificial lures. 
you know, I was making fun of someone this morning. He was try- once again trying to convince me how complicated live lining pogies is. And it's like, we won't get into that. And I was like, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, but I've been eel fishing on the islands, down the Elizabeth Islands, when it was really, really good. And I see a couple of guys, you know, and they, they, were, they were really funny. They would cast their pogies up into the air and let them slam on the water and it would stun them. And it was almost like the bass would hear the pogey slap the water. And you'd, I mean, these guys were releasing 30 pound fish. I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Just looking for a big fish. And if they were there, I was gone. They, the fish wouldn't even look at a live eel. You know, I mean, they're all, when they get fixated on pogies, forget about it. It's all over. Yeah. It's all over. it's, It's, it's all over. Just, just give it up. Go someplace else. Those fish want pogies. So Jeff was even saying these guys were, you know, like I said, in 40 feet of water on structure, on drop offs, and we're trolling. And, you know, they, they, you know, they, they weren't even necessarily trolling near pogie school. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. But, you know, so, you know, yeah, okay, bait's great. It works. But, you know, like you said, I mean, hey, I'll tell people, you know, I'll give you a plug, you know, go take a look at the video of you last year with Terry when you got that, you first brought out the China Great Swimmer and you got that 50 pound fish. I mean, I mean, it's proof in the pudding. I mean, those swimming plugs of that variety, you know, they get deep, they get down where the fish are. And I mean, they catch, you get, they get some red. I mean, when I saw that video, I was like, oh, brother. Now, <laughs> I'm not trolling. Hey, I don't care what Mike says. Yeah. I don't care about the China Great Swimmer. You know, I'm not going to start trolling. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll get you converted. Hey, Dave, I just looked at the clock. So yeah. I just want to yeah. touch on a couple other things. So have you heard anything in the race up by P-Town up that way? Is there anything going on out, out that way? I'll be honest with you. What I've heard was that there's a gen- genuine lack of mackerel. And it's really slowed fishing in Cape Cod Bay up in that area. I've heard that. Would, it, would that transfer to Barnstable Harbor that yeah, way too? Yeah, Barnstable's got some smaller fish. But, I mean, I talked to Amy over at the sports port, and she said that there are no mackerel. So the live lining guys basically have had a really rough season. Billingsgate Shoal hasn't been super, super hot. It seems that. You know, a lot of the fish, you know, have w- went right up to Boston Harbor in North that they almost bypassed, in some cases, the canal. They didn't come through the canal and get in the bay. They went around the outside. And so it's been a, it, it, I would say Cape Cod Bay, other than those tube and worm guys. And again, that's more towards the, the western part of Cape Cod Bay, from what I understand, the eastern part, you know, from you know Orleans all the way to Race Point, has to, it's been, you know, I'm not. There are always fish, but you know, you fished it when it's you know lights out, and from what I understand, it hasn't been lights out. So now I mean, that's a good segue to the canal. I, I, I'm not a canal guy. I respect it. It's just not something. But from what I'm hearing. It's a bit of a pick, but it can be good. But you got to put your time in. Is that a safe assumption yeah. for the canal fishery? Yeah, people who catch people who are not a fish the canal are catching fish. The I call them the YouTubers, the guys in the last you know when they had the blitzes from five years ago that were you know posting videos. They're waiting for other people to tell them where the fish are. It's a it you have to work. It's a struggle. It's a jig bite. The new moon. Didn't shape up in June. We've got the full moon. I think the full moon's tomorrow. I think the twenty second. So this tomorrow, week, tomorrow. I think. Yeah, yeah. So this I'll, week, I'll go with that. Okay, this week, you know, you got the breaking tides. Those early morning east turning tides. There hasn't been a topwater bite. I mean, the, that big push of you know that everybody associates with the canal when everybody goes crazy. So are there fish? No question. You might have guys are fishing nights. They're they're jigging paddle tails. They're bucktailing a little bit, but it's not. It, believe me, 
There are a lot of sad faces. It's a, it's an angler's game. Exactly. Exactly. You know, this this is where the old school guys, the guys who know how to read the canal and put their time in. It's not, you know, cast out a magic swimmer, rip it back and have a 30 pound fish. It that is not, you know, I mean, there've been spurts, but no, there has not been a it's been tough. Yeah, it's it, it's been tough. So, huh. you know, that's, that's too bad. I know a lot of people count on, but, you know, seeing the amount of fish, seeing, seeing the amount of fish I'm seeing in the sounds, I don't think that ship has sailed for the canal this year. No. And, and no. yeah. And no, I don't think so uh, either. They got to get some bait. I mean, the problem is they've got, they've got very little bait in the canal and big bait is what drives the canal, whether it be mackerel or pogies. I would say, honestly, even though I I could prove that I'm a perfect example of someone who can prove that when everybody else is catching fish on a location, Dave Perros can catch nothing. Monomoy has been, I mean, there's a lot of fish there. The tuna bite is good out east. I mean, I hear people are doing very well there. Yeah. So the tuna bite, it was hot and heavy. I feel like it cooled off for a bit. Mm-hmm. And... You know, who knows after this blow we've had this week, I feel like we're ready for a, a system reset out east. And, you know, we have at least one calm day, offshore mm-hmm. whole day this weekend. And I personally know half dozen anglers that are pointed east. It's yep. been a jig, it's been a jig bite east. I went last Tuesday. I saw infinity. I broke all my tuna rules. Don't target tuna in under 100 feet of water. Uh, yeah. For whatever reason, I can't catch them in shallow water. And two, when they're jumping and falling back into the water, it's lower than 9.82 meters per second squared. Well, they give you the side eye. That's a bad sign. I don't know if anybody listening or watching is a trout fisherman, but it feels a lot like a midge hatch. And it's a good time to go home and eat breakfast. But yeah. I grinded that out. Had a couple blow ups, but it was like musky fishing. I made 999 casts. I don't know if people know the. The saying for musky, the fish of a thousand casts. Well, mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. those fish were a fish of a thousand casts, I think I made 999. And what was painful is if I had followed and read my playbook, I would have left those fish and done a recon and found the jig bite maybe three and a half miles down the road. That's the direction the wind was biting in deeper water. They're keen in on the same thing, but for a more receptive. Mm-hmm. That said, you know, that was out of crab ledge. I, that bite cooled off right before the blow, but there's so many pushes of fish coming mm-hmm. through. And I've heard all kinds of rumors south and just that. So I, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in what I'm saying right now, but I know this time of year, it can be good one day, not good the next. Mm-hmm. And not too far away in New York waters, boats running out of Montauk, which a lot of times we share the same dump is equidistant to Falmouth and Montauk, for example. Yep. Yep. And so to your, it still blows my mind every time I think about that. But when I look at the map, it makes sense. But there's fish not too far from our local haunts. And yeah. if I were to go offshore this weekend and I'm a Falmouth guy again, so I'm looking at the south side, I would run to the Claw. I'd go to Cox's. I'd veer over maybe the northwest corner of the dump, go as far east as 31 Fathom Hole mm-hmm. on a, my loop back, cross over the fingers and intersect back with the claw again. And I know you'll see bait in life, but I would say you have at least a 50% chance at finding tuna if you run that loop. And what I like about that play is you always come home with dinner because there's plenty of opportunity to vertical jig sea bass between, you know, squid knock it, gnomons and gay head and any of the, just look at your GPS plotter for good structure on your yep. Garmin or Zimrad or whatever you're using. And you know, in just sense of, you don't even need bait, just, you know, a sexy little jig that can hold bottom and whatever the current is at the time. Let's say you come home with fish and I'm, I'm almost certain you'd find fish at gay head stripers on gay, gay head on the way home. So yeah. I like well, that early thing, season yeah. recon. Well, well, the thing, the thing is about the tuna again, I've never caught a tuna, probably never will throwing poppers and stuff, but Two things I would mention is that Evan over at Eastman's told me that there are some there, there is a decent troll bite at times down by the BB buoy. I guess with, there's been there, but the interesting story was Connor Swartz. He works over at Red Top. You know, really young, intense angler. 
he went out of a boat in Rhode Island last weekend, and they went south, just south of Montauk or that Montauk area, and they were popping small bluefin. Yeah, uh, which and is that but the spot called the Ranger? Is it the Ranger out that way? Yeah, That's probably. Right? You know, and, yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't know those spots that well. Yeah. And he said it was a blast. He said it was a lot of fun. And hopefully, you know, I guarantee there's a lot of people hoping that that whole bluefin, you know, that tuna bite goes off south of the vineyard like last year, because that was just yeah. that was wild. But yeah, so yeah, there's I, a lot I, of stuff happening. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. I bet I bet cash money if you did a good recon loop south of the vineyard. Or a good recon loop east, you're at least going to have a shot, at, an actual real shot at catching a tuna either way. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's there's plenty of bait. It's it's time they've been here. And this time mm-hmm. of year, it's with this warm weather, and we've it's been southwest all week. Right. It's like that. You know, in my playbook, I talk talk about that quite a bit. Is mm-hmm. uh, one of the triggers for me to invest some fuel without a whole lot of intel is. You know, yep. two or three days in June with really strong southwest winds, which we just, we just yeah. literally just. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, and I think there's a lot of, you know, since you mentioned the sea bass, everybody was telling me that the sea bass seemed to be a little, moving into a little deeper water. Although you seem to be doing just fine in, you know, in relatively shallow water. So, you know, I mean, you know, the thing about you, though, is that you really, you really honed in on structure. Which I think, yeah, I so I don't have specific sea bass spots. I just look at my chart plotter, and if mm-hmm. I like if there's a rock or a wreck or whatever, I try it. Mm-hmm. And it's funny this year I've been getting my biggest sea bass at slack tide, just yep. dumping the bottom with our mm-hmm. new ground fish beaky jigs because it looks very much like a crab. And you know when the tide gets cooking, the big fish are mixed in, but. I, for whatever reason, it's slack tide at my percentage of big sea bass. I may be catching fewer actual fish, but my fish, big fish per capita. Am I saying that right? My big yeah. fish per capita with the, with the, with the, the sea bass is slack tide. I've never really thought about it on that level of sea bass before, but just thumping that jig on the bottom, imitating a crab. It just, the hits have been very subtle and then they go berserk when you hook them. It's kind of interesting. What I love about yeah. the, what I love about the beaky jig thing too, is when I talk to sea bass people and they talk to me about when they're on the north side of the vineyard or whatever, and the current's really moving. They're using eight to twelve ounces of lead. I mean, that just I eight to twelve ounces of lead. Just I mean, bottom fishing with that much weight, where you're using the beaky jig at towards slack water, you don't need that kind of weight, and you're gonna an get an ounce and a half jig on my medium my medium outfit. You know, that's and, just so uh, much more fun than, you know, I mean, 12 ounces of weight. It's just, it, they've just well, blown my mind. That's cod fishing in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dave, Dave, I had to pick up my daughter at one. So I can be a few minutes late, but not. No, 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 no. You better, Emma's, so, Emma's important. Yeah. And so real quick, we got. This weather forecast of this weekend, I feel like it's changed every time I look at it, but it uh-huh. looks like, what, what are you seeing for a forecast this weekend? It, uh, winds tomorrow, you know, again, you know, 13 to 15 southwest. It looks pretty good. Sunday's looking like decent weather. I mean, it's a lot better than it was earlier in the week. I think later in the day on Sunday, or maybe it's afternoon time. It looks like it's going to really come up because Monday looks really, really, <laughs> Monday looks bad. So I would say a Sunday, it's going to be a morning. I would definitely not go offshore Monday and expect to run back. I mean, Sunday, I, tomorrow's definitely the pick of the week, the weekend. I'd say you could probably get in some deep, decent fishing Sunday morning, but you know, I mean, really check your forecast out because quite frankly, the forecast this past week with the wind was so off. I mean, yesterday. Oh boy! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you yeah. saw me going out, you Mike Mike saw me going out Thursday afternoon for a second charter, trying to get people on the water, and we got croaked. I mean, I we you know, I mean, and it wasn't even a small craft advisory out. And when we got. It, it it was as bad as I ever want to be out there in. So, you know, look at your forecast, but also trust your eyes. 
trust your instincts. And I joke, I have what I call the plus 10 rule. I take the wind forecast, add 10 knots to it. And I'm generally closer to, I mean, yesterday it was blowing 30 at one, at one point. I checked the, the buoy, I think it was. And it was like, there wasn't even 30 any, in anybody's forecast. 10 to 15 all week long. They kept saying 10 to 15 Southwest, 10 to 15 Southwest. So, yeah, but I, I definitely think the but, weekend. But on the, but, but on the flip side, it can be wrong in the other direction too. Absolutely. Just as many times. And yep. so I'm a big fan of best option that morning. And that's why, you know, I got to conclude after this, but my fishing minimalism, my simple system where it's easy to unload and preload and, and, adapt to any situation is I don't really think too much about my game plan mm -hmm. until my boat's loaded that morning and I look out the window and, and if it's windy and yeah, that might be a middle ground trip if it's yeah. a nice calm morning I might make the run to Monomoy or head offshore Busty. or whatever you know yeah and totally. yeah. yeah and so you can yeah. you can and I have some friends that are really into weather and they overthink it I, I'm a big fan of Getting getting down to the boat as early as you can. That's always a good rule of thumb. And just looking out the window, so to speak, and making best call. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and remember, the, if you're in Falmouth Harbor, poke your, poke your nose out a couple hundred yards because what's happening at the dock usually means nothing once you clear the jetties at most harbors as soon as you get out into the sound. So, yeah, but it, it, I'm glad. Today was good. I went fishing today, and and it was nice to not get Broked, you know, because I know you were laughing at me when I went out the other day, kind of going, oh. <laughs> well, the good news, and I'm going to definitely conclude on this. Yeah. The good news is the the fish are close. And, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah. yep. So get out there, folks, and yeah. hopefully you'll see us again next week. Yeah, we look forward to it. Thanks, Mike. All right. Take care, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, have a good weekend. Bye-bye.